ادب و خیر مقدم دارم خدمت اساتید گرامقدر و بزرگوار مهمانان گرامی دانشجویان عزیز که امروز در این سالن حاضر شدند تا بخشی از برنامه دومین کنفرانس ملی مطالعات زبان انگلیسی رو که با تأخیر برگزار میشه انشالله استفاده بفرمایند خورسند هم اعلام بکنم که پروفیسور ویدوسون و خانم سید الهافر وارد دانشگاه شدن چند دقیقه پیش ده دقیقه پیش وارد دانشگاه شدن و ظاهرا یک رفرشمنتی لازم بوده با توجه به شرایط سندیشون یک پنج دقیقه فرصت خواستن که به اصطلاح سریعا فکر میکنم حدودا پنج دقیقه دیگه بله وارد سالون بشن و انشالله از محصرشون اصطلاح از تحقیلی که به عمل و مدقه برنامه اعلام شده بود از روزخواهی می کنم مخصوصا از محصر اساتید بزرگوارم آقای دکتر از افتختری آقای دکتر لطفی کن که با وجود مشغله پرابان کسالت رسمی که داشتن دعوت ما رو پذیرفتن و امروز در این سال رو نازه شدن روزخواهی می کنم از محصرشون از بابت این این کامینیستی که به وجود من ما رو میبخشم به بزرگواری خودشون اگرچه در تمام این سالیان سال که ما در پای درس این بزرگواران بودیم همیشه از طرف ماها خطا بوده و از طرف ایشان بخشش و این در واقع تکرار مکررات امروز هم ادامه پیدا کرد اگر اجازه بدید اساتیدمون نمیدونم اگر فرمایش خاصی داشته باشن امر خاصی داشته باشن ما در خدمتشون باشیم گرچه برنامه را از به زحمت مجدد هم نیستیم آنی دکتر از افراد داریم آنی دکتر را چی بود اگر امری بفرمایید ما اتحاد هم بکنیم فلور در خدمت شما هست بسه اون شاید اجرا بکنم آی دکتر آهنگ شده چش چش آی دکتر این بعد آهنگ آی دکتر دو تا اجرا شد ساری کردیم و من فرض سه در سال هایی هر دوتا رو آی از طرف استاد بزرگ بزرگوارم آی دکتر لطفی بود تقدیم میکنیم به جمع حاضر Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Again, it's a great pleasure for us to welcome you to the second national conference on applied linguistics perspectives here in the beautiful setting of Tabriz, Iran. This conference aims to celebrate the key role of applied linguistics in English language studies by gathering the, by gathering the leading academic scholars and researchers of the area to share their experience and research re results on the issue of teaching English as a foreign language from the broad perspective of applied linguistics. The speeches we are going to have today have been planned as part of the second national conference on English language studies. However, because of the delay in the issuance of the visa, we were able to organize the meeting just for today. We all have waited for a long time to have our special guest, Dr. Wiedersen, lecture us. The usual trend is to introduce the speaker before he delivers his talk. This is a special case, though. The Rhodes Lake Encyclopedia of Language Teaching and Learning calls Professor Wiedersen probably the most influential philosopher of the late 20th century for international ESOLs. So he really doesn't need an introduction. I thought instead of saying something about him, I had better to ask him to come to the trivium. Therefore, we are very fortunate that today 
In this event, Professor Peterson has come to Iran so that we can benefit from his blogs. So I would like to invite Dr. Salashu to the podium to open the meeting. Please accompany me with your applause. stage. <clears throat> the reason is I am uh, drunk <laughs> of a different nature. I'm drunk of this presence, very um, precious, invaluable presence of uh, everybody and uh, I'm sure quite certain that this presence this very invaluable, precious presence is because of another presence, and that's presence of two great professors, Professor Wilson and Professor Seidel Hofer. I haven't prepared anything in advance uh, because I was very busy and uh, I, I didn't uh, really thought it was necessary and as mentioned by uh, presenter um, Professor Willison does not need any, um, in, uh, any introduction. However, I, I would like to say a few words and uh, probably I would introduce him in another way, another aspect of his uh, presence, uh, something probably not written in uh, uh, Wikipedia or encyclopedias, but something very personal to me. Um, I don't know how to organize my thoughts. I mean, I mean that's an a, a issue for discussion later. I mean, the relationship between thought and language, in fact. Um, I assume that... Uh, <clears throat> I remember uh, a poem by Lord Byron, Ocean, I, when I was uh, teaching it. Uh, um, he, is, um, uh, he was uh, complaining about words and language that these words cannot be, ex these feelings he had, the romantic feelings he had, cannot be expressed by words. And I believe that thoughts are larger than words, feelings are larger than words. Uh, but that's a blessing, that's not a limitation to language, that's a, that's a blessing for communication because otherwise if we were able to communicate all our feelings through language, we wouldn't be able to understand each other because these feelings are very unique. And language um, as a shared uh, device for... Uh, <coughs> thank you. A shared device for communication, uh, although... Um, refines our thoughts and gives it order, uh, makes it linear, uh, makes it also possible to communicate. So my thoughts uh, cannot be expressed at the moment, uh, however, I have a few words. Um, um, eight years I spent, uh, seven years actually, uh, I spent my life, uh, academic life with Professor Witherson, but it wasn't only academic. Uh, I learned many things from him. If I want to summarize uh, what uh, uh, I went through with, in, in, in uh, living with him academically and also personally, I can just uh, find, I just find one word. He is a, uh, a real arif in our sense. In, Arif, um, I have to translate it by I can. Arif means a, a mystic person, a person who has access to um, layers, deeper layers of, uh, of uh, uh, meanings, deeper layers of understanding of the universe and of life. 
and on wisdom, yes, and wisdom. Um, and I, I saw that in you, and uh, in several occasions. <laughs> Yesterday, um, in the uh, closing uh, ceremony, we missed him, but... Uh, uh, all this, uh, during the conference, I, I, I'm sure all of us miss him, his presence here. Before today, I had a very cynical explanation for why it happened, why this happened. I mean, he got his visa late, and he was not able to come to the conference. Today, I found, the, I found an answer for this, and I, I'm not cynical anymore, right? Um, I'm more optimistic, and I, I find this, uh, let's say, Hekma, as I was explaining, uh, a hekma for this uh, delay. And uh, you know, this today is a precious day, a beautiful day. I mean, uh, climate-wise, but also a very, very precious day. Um, if uh, he got his visa on Friday and he came on uh, uh, this Sunday, and attended the conference, probably we would have left uh, last night to Islam. But because of this delay, now he is here today. And today is a special day for <laughs> Iranians, for Iranian academics and teachers, and you know that. And today is Teacher's Day. <laughs> now I see the uh, blessing, the blessing for that. It's Teacher's Day, and uh, sitting here, I see most uh, old teachers, but some of them my personal teachers. Dr. Azab Tafteri, uh, Professor Azab Tafteri, Professor Lutfi Bo, and, uh, and uh, yes, and uh, Professor Azab, uh, Professor Wilson. Um, I was introduced to Professor Wilson before I saw him, before I met him, when I was an MA student at Tabriz University, 1984. Um, the first time in my classes with Dr. Professor Lutvipur and also Professor Azaf Dafteri, we didn't, uh, I hadn't met him, but I got to know him academically. His, uh, his dichotomy, uh, you know, language teaching as communication was the first book we read, I remember. And then some other names, of course, uh, associated with Professor with some great names like Halliday, like Abercrombie, like uh, Lyons, and uh, all, the, all, all these two great professors uh, I had in Tabriz University, Professor Azad Daftari and Professor uh, Lotifu, great teachers I had. Then I left uh, uh, for my PhD to uh, England, all by chance because I had other uh, admissions, other from other universities in other countries, but the Ministry of uh, Science and <coughs> Culture, at that time called Science and Culture of Iran, decided that I should go to uh, England, as, as Professor Alami knows this, I mean, he was also uh, in England at the same time I was, he was in Lancaster and I was in uh, Edinburgh, then I, I came down to Essex. And he was uh, supervised by Charles Alderson and testing, and uh, I was supervised by Professor Wilson. Uh, he was at that time at the University of London. You know London is a very expensive city for Iranians, for, for students, so I couldn't go to London. So I had to uh, do my first year in Edinburgh. Then I learned that Professor Wilson has a uh, come as when I mean, has gone to Essex University, and it was uh, thrilling for me. So I remember that particular day, uh, that particular day, uh, very, very vividly. I telephoned uh, Martin Atkinson, Professor Martin Atkinson, you remember, he was the head of the department of Essex University, and I said, well, I want to come to Essex. And I said, why? I mean, he knew me because I had also an admission from Essex University. He said, so why don't you turn up? And I said, well, all sorts of things. And then, all right, he said, what can I do for you? I said, well, I want to work with Professor Wilson. So I uh, come and meet him. And if he says, all right, no problem. And then we set the time, and he knew when Professor Wilson was uh, there. So 
Uh, when, uh, from Edinburgh to Essex is a long way, so I, when I went there, and uh, I met Martin Atkinson, I said, well, where can I find Professor Witteson? He said, uh, language, Department of Language and Linguistics in the common room. And I said, well, how can I recognize him? And he said, well, the tallest guy in the, <laughs> the, tallest guy in the room would be Professor Witteson. So uh, I, I went there and I found him. He was uh, surrounded by his... Uh, many students and many PhD students there, so I uh, squeezed a little uh, space and time and I said, well, I'm from Iran and uh, I want to work with you. I said, okay. okay. He didn't ask me any question, just, do you have a proposal? I said, yes. So, let, show it to me. I showed it to him. He read it very quickly, it was short. And that proposal, I remember, uh, we had uh, uh, worked out with uh, Professor uh, Lotfi Poor uh, before my uh, departure from Iran. So, all right, um, go and uh, uh, walk around the university uh, um, and then come back in half an hour. So after half an hour, I returned and said, all right, what? I was expecting a yes answer. Yes. So what shall I do, I said. So, go and pack up from Edinburgh and come to Essex. I said, well, well I, I haven't been transferred from uh, Edinburgh to Essex University. I mean, given the Iranian, uh, let's say, experience of transferring from one university to another university, which is a headache. He said, well, so why do you think I asked you to go and walk around for half an hour? It was all because I wanted to telephone Edinburgh University. And, And he made it pos possible, possible for me to... Uh, <laughs> he made it possible for me to finish my PhD there and uh, learn from him. Well, I learned many things, many, many things. I cannot, I mean, it's uh, some of is, uh, I mean, beyond the patience of the, uh, the audience and time. So I will keep it for individual uh, dialogues with individual people. So I'm very, very proud and uh, uh, happy that uh, I was able to um, um, share his presence, physical presence, uh, with you, because I had that experience before. But I wanted to share it with my I had talked about you in my classes, and everybody knows, and so I wanted to, I, I wanted you to share his presence and feel what I felt and what I feel now today. His presence is a discourse itself. I mean, no need to talk. I mean, his presence is being here is a discourse itself, and I leave that discourse for you to uh, interact and uh, find meaning out of his presence. Thank you very much.
can I, what can I say? Uh, first, um, to say how wonderful it is for me and for um, my wife Barbara Seidelhofer to be here. And um, I'm sorry that we were not here three days ago. And um, thinking of the past, uh, Fazad Salashur and I go back, as he has mentioned, a long way. Uh, he is, uh, um, how, how shall I put it, an enormous credit, I think, um, to the profession. And I am very proud to think that I have made some small contribution um, to his own career. Um, as you know, there is quite a long history of an association between uh, Tabris and uh, British scholarship. Um, the ESP project in Tabriz many, many years ago um, was in part directed by another student of mine, Martin Bates, um, also in Edinburgh. Uh, the difference between him and Salah and uh, Fazad, of course, is that um, Fazad moved from Edinburgh and uh, came to work with me um, in, in the University of Essex. Um, it was for me a very rewarding uh, experience. You, you, you must not get the impression that this was um, a unilateral benefit from me to him. On the contrary, I, th I think all teachers know on this teacher's day uh, what makes a teacher is the relationship with the students and the students have as much um, uh, advantage that is as much credit uh, as do the teachers and uh, it's uh, often the case that for example when one examines a PhD uh, thesis you're actually also examining not only the student but the teacher and what you have is a joint enterprise and the relationship between teacher and student is always if it's to be effective, is um, a, a, a unit, a, a bilateral one, an interdependent one, where both sides benefit. And that actually is one of the issues that I'll be touching upon today. Another theme, uh, and again this very much relates um, to um, Fazad and myself and our, and, and our association. Another theme is um, how times change. Because, uh, uh, of course, we say, oh, you, you, you haven't seen you for a long time, you, uh, um, you haven't changed a bit. You're still the same as you always were. But, of course, only up to a point, uh, ladies and gentlemen, only up to a point, because there are, of course, uh, traces of time. Um, one gets a little grey. Uh, maybe one loses a little bit of vital energy. Uh, some things do change and uh, I think uh, uh, we must recognise that in education. Um, and particularly in uh, language education. And even more particularly perhaps uh, in English language education because the world has changed uh, over the past 25-30 years um, the status of English has changed claims to its use and its ownership have changed it's no longer um, so much a domestic property of the native speakers but it is a language which um, can and has been appropriated for all manner of other purposes. Research, for example, we've 
just mention this to the Vice Director of Research here at the University for diplomacy, for conflict resolution, for business, for everything associated with that globalized world. So the language has changed, the status, the role of English has changed. And so one ought to suppose should the teaching of English also change correspondingly. So let me begin my talk after this rather long um, preface. Um, I have a number of um, PowerPoint slides. This was one of the techniques, the, the advanced technology that I had to learn. Um, again, when one thinks of increasing age, it becomes less easy to adapt to all of this technical wizardry. Um, but I, what I propose to do is to talk um, to these slides and, and hope that I will be able to make some coherent connection between them. Um, in other words, I hope that the text which these <laughs> slides represent will be interpreted by you in a coherent discourse that you will, uh, in a way, piece out my imperfections with your thoughts. Those, of course, are not my words, but as many of you recognize, they are the words of William Shakespeare. And um, literature is also um, uh, going to be represented in a minor way because, let me just mention this before I begin, just as I um, believe that um, the nature of uh, the English language, the role and nature of the English language has changed um, and that this change has made one realize the crucial feature of creativity uh, in language use um, and we see this in the use of English as a lingua franca for example where people can and do creatively make use of the resources of English and don't necessarily have to conform to the conventions of the standard language. That of course reminds one of creative writing as it's called, uh, literature, the literary use uh, of language. And just as um, my um, just as um, English as a lingua franca um, has uh, um, its creativity and is noted, notable in many ways because it is creative, so it links up with uh, the literal use of language. And there are many, and um, I won't do that now, but I could cite um, poetic texts um, and discuss their creativity in just the same way as one might discuss the creativity of texts produced by uh, users of English as a lingua franca who are not uh, uh, native speakers. Some users of English as a lingua franca, of course, are native speakers, but many, many are not. So literature is also, I mean, the, 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 the notion of creativity, the notion of um, how one exploits the resources of language in order to achieve an impact, achieve an effect, um, is as relevant to the everyday use of English as it is to uh, uh, literature, poet, poetry. So in a sense, uh, they are realizations of the same basic um, um, use of language. Right, so my title, Linguistics, Expertise and Language Experience. Um, and Applied Linguistics and English Language Teaching. Um, I 
The uh, title is, uh, comes from, again, literature, T.S. Eliot, To Seize and Clutch and Penetrate Expert Beyond Experience. And the point I want to make is that in linguistics, we get a claim to expertise. Uh, as a, 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 the disciplinary study of language, um, linguistics does claim to be, or to reveal, uh, features of language by means of expertise beyond, um, beyond experience. Um, applied linguistics, uh, as this is a quotation from Guy Cook, um, defined as problems in the world in which language is implicated, is concerned not with the, the abstractions of linguistics, because by expertise one means that one is abstracting from actuality some underlying features which are not immediately appear, um, apparent, but that, are, that are not experienced directly, but are cognitively abstracted. So, linguistics is concerned with um, the abstraction, the abstract nature of language, but applied uh, linguistics is concerned with the, act, the actual problems of language experience. So, these are all the same. Clear. I mean, you can't equate um, the actual problems of language experience with the abstract problems of linguistics, of linguistics expertise. Uh, um, so linguistics can never capture the reality of actual experience. Um, the point about applied linguistics, the claim about applied linguistics, is that it mediates between the expertise and experience that somehow a connection could be made between the two. Um, that the actuality of problems can be in some sense explained or clarified or resolved even by reference to the abstract expertise categories uh, of linguistics. These categories, this expertise which is based upon an, an idealization, an abstraction um, from actually occurring reality. So the question that arises in applied linguistics um, is what kind of insights about language can uh, linguistics expertise reveal? Uh, um, there has been some a, a lot of discussion about the nature of applied linguistics and how it is not the same as linguistics applied, and you may well be familiar with this discussion. Um, but it's clear that if it's the case, it, 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 this I take it is um, uh, is the case. If it's the case that uh, no disciplinary abstraction can capture the experienced reality of individuals, whether this be a language or anything else, if that is the case, um, then there must be some way of making this abstraction actual in reference to the real problems of the world. There must be some insights that enable you to reformulate what these problems might be. And that is applied to the, the linguistics applied would be to, to say, well, we can directly relate these um, these abstractions to reality. So, what is what insight? What insights does uh, does linguistics expertise provide? Well, linguistics is essentially concerned with competence. Um, and that, of course, is a, a term and a concept that has been um, established orthodox, so to speak, for a very long time. Um, linguistic competence as a knowledge of the encoding rules. And communicative competence, 
which is a knowledge of usage conventions. Conventions of how people actually make use of the rules in communicative behavior. As you will know, communicative competence, the limited competence, of course, is, is Chomsky's uh, uh, term and Chomsky's concept, the, the, the knowledge um, of the actual encoding rules, the, 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 um, um, the grammar, the sentences that um, uh, a speaker has of his or her uh, language. And communicative competence is a matter of judging not just that, which is the possible in Heinz's terms, I assume you're familiar with this formulation, but also, as Heinz points out, uh, if you're competent in a language, uh, you're able to make judgments not only whether a piece of language, a sample of language, um, is grammatically correct, well formed, in terms of encoding rules, but also whether it is relatively easy to process, cognitively speaking, psychologically speaking, whether it's appropriate to the context in which it's used, and whether it's actually done, whether it's actually tested um, as having been performed. And that's communicative competence. Um, In both cases, however, notice that um, there's the same basic presupposition. That with Chomsky, uh, linguistic competence, the ideal speaker listener, completely, and this of course he's been much criticized for, but how can we talk about ideal speaker listeners and such thing? Uh, speech communities are not homogeneous and so on. Um, but if you look at what Heine says, you get the same presupposition of a norm, of a native speaker norm, an ideal native speaker, in fact. There is an important sense, says Heine, which a normal member of a community, a normal member of a community, has knowledge, has knowledge with respect to all of these aspects, as to say, uh, feasible, uh, possible, feasible, appropriate, and so on, um, all these aspects of the community, community systems, system is a, is, is, a, is a normative notion, a system is a system, it has its internal consistency and so on, it's stable, um, so that in both cases, we're talking about a norm, a norm, a a, an ideal uh, set of stable uh, conditions. And that's competence. So whether we're talking about linguistic or communicative competence, the same normative uh, assumption is made. That, that competence is competence in a language. A language. Which is spoken by a community. And it's the community and the language that together constitute uh, the norm. Um, so it's, in both cases, what is talking about communal competence, whether it's linguistic or communicative, is communal. It's the competence of a, 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 a normal or ideal uh, representative speaker of a particular community, in a particular community. So, competence, community, and communication are very closely interrelated. The three C's, so to speak, um, merge into one basic as assumption of the norm. The normal, com normal, communi normal communication. So, linguistics, I'm suggesting, is essentially normative. That, that's the way linguistics has, generally speaking, um, being conducted on a normative basis. It presupposes a social or communal norm. 
The language is the language spoken by the community. A language, a community. And the two are related. So that's the object of linguistics. Expertise. The expertise of linguistics is concerned with competence, i.e. a norm of knowledge or behaviour. It's also assumed to be the language subject, the subject that is taught. Uh, and competence um, is represented as being the basic objective. Um, communicative competence these days and whether you're talking about clear or um, task-based learning or whatever it is uh, the assumption is that the ultimate objective is to achieve native speaker competence um, so the foreign language subject um, is based on the teaching of competence. Normative competence, the competence of a particular community. Um, and I think when one looks at the, the language subject, in that case, we're talking particularly about English, English as a subject to be taught in schools and elsewhere, there are two considerations, I think, to simplify matters. One has to think, in defining a subject, and actually this will apply, I think, to any subject, any pedagogically defined subject, whether this were English or any other. Um, the first consideration is, what is the objective? What is it that, at the end of a course, um, learners will have assumed to have achieved? That's the objective, that's the aim, that's the target, if you like. Um, oh, um, sorry. The second is the process. What do you have to do, or what do learners have to do to get to the objective? What is, how do you design a subject which has a, a particular objective and a particular process which is effective in achieving it? So these are the two considerations. Um, now, I think it's important to recognize, as far as um, the, 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 we go back to the ex we call expertise and experience, right? Um, I mean, previously I talked about the experience of users. The experience of language learners, I mean, they also, uh, uh, their, ex their actual experience is also in many ways problematic, and that's why applied linguistics is concerned with the problems um, of language experienced in the real world. In this case, it's language experienced by learners in the real world. And for the learners, that is their real world. Their real world is there in the classroom. So they, there they are. Um, um, and it's their experience that we are concerned with as teachers. And it's controlled by teaching. I think that's, I think, important to know, at least this is, I think, the orthodox traditional way of thinking, certainly of English teaching. And therefore, the object, uh, the, the, uh, the objective, is a matter of controlling the learner into conformity to competence. Uh, so, co so conformity overrides almost everything else in terms of the objective. If you don't conform to these native speaker norms, you, you get a bad result in the exam. And so clearly it's important for the, the language teacher to ensure that the learner, uh, learners are prepared to conform to what the examination requires. And that examination requires competence, and that competence requires conformity. Now, this is the objective is since competence is normative, relates to a particular community, 
What he means is that the objective in English, we don't think about English teaching, but it could apply to any language. The objective is to in some way initiate learners into the membership of a native speaker community. Or at least to identify with that native speaker community. Because competence is based on the communal norm of those speakers. Therefore, the objective is to make learners as much like native speakers as possible. Right? To conform. And the degrees of non-conformity represent degrees of error. I think what one did, this raises the question uh, in terms of the objective of um, the objective of identifying with or bidding for membership of a particular native speaking community. I think it raises the question of what foreign language teaching and learning uh, actually means. What we're talking about learning about English as a foreign language, uh, English for speakers of other languages. So English is a foreign language. Um, and English teaching is one example of the teaching of foreign languages. But I think it's important to, to consider what is it that makes a language foreign? Right? Uh, there are different kinds of foreignness in different languages. And therefore, one might assume different learning objectives. When one thinks about it, um, um, a, a language is only foreign in relation to one's own. But these relationships between own language and other language are enormously varied. That relationship between, uh, I don't know, uh, between Chinese and Japanese, uh, to learning Japanese in China is a very different uh, experience from learning Japanese in Austria. Languages which are, so to speak, domestic, border languages, are foreign very di in a very different way from languages which are geographically, socioculturally remote. And it's the, the, the nature of the foreignness that one has to understand if one is teaching a foreign language. Because if you are um, um, and, unless you, you, you can identify the nature of the foreigners, then you can't know what your objective is going to be. Um, so, if you're teaching Japanese as a foreign language, for example, depending on the way you're teaching it, if you're teaching it in China, that's one thing, if you're teaching it in Austria, it's another thing, if you're teaching it in Iran, it's a very different thing. The foreignness relationship is very different. Um, so, uh, Japanese is a foreign language. Japanese uh, teaching Japanese to speakers of other languages depends on who the other languages are, uh, who the speakers are of the other languages, and the same would be true of German, for example. Now, in the case of Japanese, it may well be because Japanese is only spoken by Japanese that the people in the language are very closely associated. Of course, it makes sense to say if you're teaching Japanese. You can't avoid, really, uh, teaching Japanese social behavior, cultural mores, and so on and so forth, because the community and the language are indeed very closely related. <coughs> and particularly, and your reason for learning Japanese is likely to be that you wish to identify in some way, or at least be able to be on equal terms, socially, communally, with the Japanese. With the German, as of teaching German to speakers of other languages, maybe less so. There are, uh, partly because there are at least three countries that speak German, right? Um, and if one thinks of 
Farsi is foreign language? Teaching Farsi to speakers of other languages? Who are, again, who are the other languages? Who, who are the speakers of the other languages? Well, how do these other languages relate to Farsi? Um, and I won't go into this, but uh, um, uh, there, there has been a good deal of discussion, of course, uh, but, but particularly by Bourdieu, the, the, the French philosopher, about different kinds of capital. He talks about how languages have different kinds of capital for different people. So that some languages have a high cultural capital, right? um, or a social capital. And in other words, the, the, they are valuable because of the social advantage you get from learning it. Or the cultural advantage, you have, and this may be true for some people studying English, they may see English as having enormous cultural capital, and so they study English literature, for example, and fine, that's the objective. Um, other languages have high uh, um, uh, economic capital, right? Where you don't care about the culture, you know, I'm not interested in the culture, I'm not interested in the social life of the English, but English has a high capital, a high economic capital. It's, it's, it's worth learning because uh, it provides a certain <laughs> economic advantage. So, different foreignnesses of the other languages clearly are relevant to defining what the different objectives are. And as I mentioned briefly right at the beginning, one of the issues that um, is of very of considerable concern, and particularly Professor Seidelhofer's concern, is uh, making clear what the, the nature the, of the foreignness, so to speak, of English is. And that English is a lingua franca, uh, use of English is a lingua franca, um, means that English, the foreignness of English, the otherness of English, is not the same as the otherness of other languages. It's become a language um, mainly because of its economic capital, that but not only that, I mean, it's also because of its dip diplomatic value, uh, its value for negotiation, um, conflict resolution, and so on. It has become appropriated by an enormous range of people who speak other languages. So its, it's foreignness is distinctive. And this I've just mentioned, uh, different kinds of capital, as Bourdieu calls it, um, must mean there are different purposes for learning and different objectives are uh, therefore defined. And with English, unlike perhaps other languages, um, it's essentially not for intra communal communication, not for communication within a bounded community, but inter common or communication globally across primary communities. So, it can't be defined in terms of competence, right? which is normative and is related to intra common or communication. So the what I'm suggesting is, uh, and, uh, as I say, in reference to the work of uh, Professor Seidel, for the global use of English is actually is the actual experience. Going back to the experience and expertise, uh, if expertise depends on the concept of competence, it does not correspond to the actual experience of English globally as an intercommunal means of international communication. So that really, though, when people talk about real English, uh, this is, was um, for some time um, 
uh, a, a popular slogan helped the learner with real English, authentic English, the English that English speakers actually use. What is actually performed in Heinrich's sense, what is actually performed, um, that actually is not real for most users of English in the world. That reality is, a, is the reality of native speaker communities, not the reality of the experience of most, you know, but they are now the majority, most users of English in the world. So English has naturally become denationalized, uh, uncoupled from its primary uh, culture. So what we see uh, in the use of English in the Frank and the global use of English in the intercommunal use of language is communication without community. There is no well-defined English-speaking community. Uh, it's constantly shifting and changing networks of interaction through digital communication and so on. There is no English-speaking community. And communication without competence. Because it's community without conformity to a norm. Communicative language teaching um, because it teaches communicative competence um, isn't actually teaching communication. Its focus is not on how language is used in communication. Its focus is on how English is used particularly among a particular community of native speakers. Um, it's, it, 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 it focuses on the form, and this is the objective, is to acquire the form that communication takes in native speaking communities. Not how language is used as a resource for communication. Because if you look at examples of classroom practice, task-based learning and so on, uh, there may be some allowance made for learner initiative, but um, if they use language, not, not only English, but other linguistic resources they may have at their disposal, to achieve their communicative objective, that does not count as being um, uh, an acceptable result unless it leads to conformity. So, although there may be a kind of initiative going on among learners, ultimately the objective is conformity. To bring the linguistic forms they use into conformity with the conventional and the correct. So, you get this is an example from Michael Swart. Um, Excellent, excellent book if you assume that uh, English learners, all English learners, whatever they're learning it for, um, are required to conform, then of course practical English usage means English usage by the English, uh, mainly, or sometimes by the Americans, we allow them to use English from time to time. But basically, you know, this, you want to conform and therefore pass your exam, this is what. So, don't say this, and in, and in practical English, this is in red, don't say this, common mistake. It's often raining here, it can rain this evening, I gave to her my address. Please explain me what you want. I object to tell them my age, no doubt the word is so on. Well, the fact is that people do say this. They say it all the time. Even native speakers say this, right? Uh, and certainly, if you look at the kind of data that uh, Barbara Seidlob has been looking at, people say all these things all the time and communicate in a perfectly effective way. So, communication and competence are not the same thing. Clearly. So, we need, I'm suggesting that. that uh, we need to rethink thinking of the two aspects of the language subject, the English language subject, the objective and the process. We need to rethink the objective. 
in the light of globalization. Right? This is, uh, the conventional objective is, I'm suggesting, irrelevant. In many cases. And if it's relevant, you've got to explain why. If it's relevant to conform to make these speaker norms, if you've got an argument, fine. I mean, we're not ruling that out as a possible objective, but if you do have that as an objective, don't take it because it's always been the objective, but in a changing world, why is this still relevant? So there's a need to realign objective with other problems involving language in the real world. You're realigning the objective with experience. The real and re real experience that people have with English when they're having to cope with situations in the real world, whether this is diplomacy or business negotiation or conflict resolution or whatever it may be. This really is the challenge of making um, English as a lengua franca a genuinely applied linguistics concern because it's concerned with real world problems in a big way. So I'm suggesting then, and uh, this is my take on this, I, mean, uh, you know, I, don't want, I don't want you to assume that this, you know, this, is, this is a new enlightenment. I'm putting this forward as um, issues that seem to me we need to critically think about. Um, and what I'm suggesting, uh, in order to provoke discussion, um, is that the present orthodox approach to reality is irrelevant. And it's unrealistic. It's unrealistic. And here we come to um, what I call the pedagogy of failure. So far, I've looked at this from the point of view of the objective. What about from the point of view of the pedagogic process? Um, how, so I've talked about how users experience it and how the experience of English users ought to affect how we define the objective. I want now just to mention how users, how users experience it. Uh, sorry, how learners experience it. So we move from uh, the objective defined on the objective to the process. How am I doing for time, by the way? It's, uh, aren't you all feeling the need for lunch or short, short break? All right. You asked for it. Here we go. How do learners experience English? What makes English foreign for the learners? Now, again, I mean, this is starting with the obvious. But what, what is the process of teaching and learning? And I notice it's almost always in that direction. It's always in that, in that sequence. Language teaching and learning. It isn't very often language learning and teaching, right? Uh, and that itself presupposes a certain hierarchical relationship. <laughs> uh, so, well, sometimes things are, but I think very often the assumption is that these are converse dependencies, that teaching and learning as verbs in English are the same as giving and taking and setting and buying. That is, they give something and that presupposes that it's taken. So I give this to you, you take this from me. Uh, I sell this to you, therefore, automatically, you buy this from the song. And I teach this to you, automatically you learn this. So that there's an assumption of interdependencies in the same way as giving, taking, um, selling and buying. So she's teaching the English, um, always presupposes that there are learners. Uh, you can't teach without learners, right? Uh, she's learning English. Teachers are not presupposed. So you can learn without teaching. Teachers are not necessary for learning. We know that. We learn on our own. Right? 
Um, and ultimately, learning is a very private, individual experience. Um, so English taught as a foreign language, ETFL, English taught as a foreign language, is not necessarily the same as English learned as a foreign language, E-L, E-L-F-L. And we know that. We know that teachers spend a lot of time teaching what learners to annoyingly and perversely don't learn. Why don't they learn? Right? I've taught them that scores of time, they still haven't learned it. It's their fault. Well, A, it's clear that this dependency doesn't work. You can't say, I've sold you this several times, you still haven't bought it. Doesn't make any sense. I've given you this, you haven't taken it. That doesn't make any sense. I've taught you this, you haven't learned it. That makes sense. Why? So teacher English is not the same as learner English. Because learner English doesn't conform to teacher English. Conformity, again, comes on the scene. Uh, as with the uh, learner experience of language, as the same as um, users, learners are also users. Um, when they come up with non-conformist results, uh, which are still effectively communicative, they're clearly communicatively capable. Furthermore, they bring to the learning of a foreign language, English, a capability for communicating that they've already acquired in their own language, or languages. Learners are actually linguistically quite sophisticated. Right? They know already how language is used to communicate. They've had that experience for ten, five, ten, fifteen years. Often with more than one language, of course. So what is the nature of learner language actually? Now, normally it's stigmatized as full of error, right? What's wrong with my learners is that they produce errors, right? But you could see errors as the learners attempt to learn, that these are part of the learning process. And not only that, but part of the using process, that maybe the learners are making the most effective use of whatever resource they've got to get their meaning across. They get penalized for it if it's not correct. But nevertheless, the, the motivation may be community. So the error may be a sign that the learners are attempting to use the foreign language in the same way as they use their own. And it's interesting, it seems to me at least, worth thinking about, that the errors, so-called, that learners produce most often, are those which are most resistant to teaching are those that are of least communicative value. That teachers can spend a very long time trying to get learners to produce, to conform, to produce to certain, to produce certain correct forms in vain. And this may be because the correctness is not essential to the communicative value of the expression. So, in a way, the teacher is teaching against communication, uh, undermining the efforts of the learner to be communicative capable and using their own experience to extend it 
into the acquiring of a wider, wider, uh, a, a, more, a wider uh, linguistic resource. So the learner, well, you could say, uh, can be seen to have a certain communicative authenticity. It's not the authenticity of the native speaker, but what is authentic for the native speaker is not necessarily authentic for the non-native speaker. Huh? And what is authentic for the, the uh, in terms of what is recorded in a corpus of English uh, of native English speakers can't often be made real in the context of the learning platform. So that the, the reality of language for the learner is not at all the same as the reality of language for the native speaker. So what we find here, if we think it is not of correctness and conformity, but in terms of what is communicatively appropriate and effective, and you know, give a resource in order to get their meaning across and achieving it, I mean, this shows a good deal of communicative capability, so why should they be penalized because it doesn't conform? So learning as conformity, and learning therefore is seen as a reflex of teaching. Right. What you learn, what learners learn, is given credit to the extent that it corresponds to what is taught. That examinations are examinations of what is taught, not what is learned. They, are, um, they assess English taught as a foreign language, but not English learned as a foreign language. So that learn, although lip service is paid to the idea of learner autonomy, learner initiative, only up to a point. So long as you are controlled into conformity, eventually. Effectively then, when we talk about the relationship of learning and teaching, these are not so much learners as teachees. Teachees in the sense of uh, um, that if you have an employer, you have an employee. Right? In the same way, the, the way we generally, I think, conceive of English teaching is that learners are actually converted into teachees. That what they learn is only credited to the extent it conforms to what is taught. Totally dependent on the, on the, the teacher. A teacher is a dependency. Just as, you know, you can't have an employee without an employer, and the employer controls the employee, so <laughs> the teacher is controlled by the teacher. But the learner is not. So looking at teaching, what have I said? I don't know where I've got to now. I think we're coming to the end, you would please to know. <laughs> teaching English to speakers of other languages. What I've been suggesting for your consideration is that you need to think again about the English. English. Who's English? What does it English mean? What significance does it have? What is value? Whose English are we talking about? Teaching English to speakers of other languages. Unidirectional. I got English, I teach it to you. Over to you. And you speak in other languages, you accept unilaterally what I give you. Two. Not four, two. It's not teaching English for speakers of other languages, but teaching two speakers. Prepositions can be quite significant. As those dealing with critical discourse analysis will know. Teaching it to speakers of other languages. As if the people were defined in one category. You're all speakers of other languages, right? Whether you're um, Iranian or Japanese or Chinese or German or whatever. You're all foreign, right? You're all other. Uh, as if you're all the same. 
And you're not, of course, all the same. <laughs> other languages are foreign in different ways. Other speakers of other languages, clearly, um, are, are very different. So I'm suggesting that we should look at um, the, the way we define all of the features of the subject we're supposed to be teaching in terms both of the objective and in terms of the process. I'm suggesting that um, we should think in terms of communication beyond conformity, capability beyond competence. I'm suggesting that the, the orthodox view is that English as a native language um, is, which is what English taught as a foreign language is, so English as a native language is the competence which is the object and the process of English taught as a foreign language. But if one is looking at English learnt as a foreign language, how English is learnt and used as a foreign language is much closer to English as a lingua franca. So there's a, just as I'm suggesting that we should change, at least consider changing, the association. I started with uh, thinking of expertise from um, the, the, the frame of reference being English as a native language, which is English taught as a foreign language to shift the focus to look at how English learned as a foreign language actually corresponds more closely, not only in objective, but in process, to the use of English as a lingua franca. So, finally, go back to the title, expertise in linguistic, experience of language, what kind of insights are relevant to the applied linguistics of English language teaching? What I would suggest is that the kind of insights um, are that we, what we, what I suggest we, we need to look for, at least consider, is a linguistics, not of a linguistics of language, of how language uh, is used, because. This is not the same as looking at the characteristics of a language. That we should focus on communication, how language is used in communication, and we see how this uh, works with English as lingua franca studies, where, where the very process of using the resources of language to achieve communication is made so clearly overt. Uh, you can see it happening, so to speak, before your very eyes. But one should think of capability, uh, capability to communicate, rather than competence, which is fixed to a, lin a linguistic and communicative norm. And one should think of creativity, which is what I referred to right at the beginning, rather than conformity. In other words, what I'm suggesting is that we need to recognize that the world has changed from the days in Essex when I was working with uh, Vaza, that the world in English has changed, that we are living in a world of international, globalized, digital communication. Um, and just as um, the nature of separate languages, well, can't think of separate languages quite so clearly as before. So we can't really think of certainly English as we thought of it before. Therefore, we shouldn't perhaps think of linguistics as we thought of it before, but more in terms of uh, linguistics of uh, English as a lingua franca. Thank you very much.
for some questions. Uh, are you happy with that? Okay. We have time for a few questions. Uh, take turns and I'll give you the microphone to uh, ask your question. Okay. Um, that they mark the identity of the speaker. 
Um, but, but users know this. They know how to vary and to adapt them, their, their use of uh, English and any other language. So there is knowledge. What I'm arguing for is a linguistics of the knowledge of language which is not that which requires a conformity to the notion of competence. So you can be, uh, you can talk about the, the linguistics of if this is a lingua franca, you're still talking about a knowledge and you cannot do otherwise if you're talking about linguistics. Thank you a lot for your intriguing speech and a lot of intricacies you mentioned. Uh, according to your recent viewpoint, have you made any modification in the redefinition of applied linguistics and its contribution to say to answering a lot of questions in the realm of pedagogy? Yeah, thank you. Um, no, I, I mean, the idea, the general uh, definition of applied linguistics as being um, um, uh, an exploration of uh, the problems in the real world that have to do with language in order to clarify and in some sense attempt to resolve them. That is a definition I would still believe to be valid. I think what has tended to happen in applied linguistics um, is that the starting point has tended to be the linguistics rather than the applied side. And that there's a good deal of discussion about the interdisciplinarity of applied linguistics. Um, and this is partly in order to make applied linguistics more respectable, so to speak. It sounds uh, more like a, a respectable academic subject to say that it's interdisciplinary it's far less impressive to, to say that you're actually dealing with, with real-world problems. So my um, point, I think, would be that the starting point needs to be the problems. That one needs to see how language is actually being used, not how it ought to be used, not basing a pedagogy on the way the learners ought to learn English, but the way users actually do use English. And if you look at the way people actually do use English, then you're bound to refer to the problems in the real world because the problems of mutual understanding, of, uh, of diplomatic differences, of uh, business negotiation, all of these, these are not English problems, they're communicative problems. There are problems that have to do with how people manage to interact with each other, to affect each other, influence each other. How do they use language to do that? So it's a matter of how do people actually use language when they interact with other people, whatever the language may be. How do they do it? How is it that people with relatively incompetent, relatively incompetent English, how do they manage to achieve their objectives? They do. How do they manage it? That's the starting point. Not, you know, assuming there is a competence that everyone has to conform to. So I agree with that. The planning question is about problems. So let's look at what the problems are. And what in the real world really needs to be addressed. And how English is involved. That's the way around I would like it to go. And let's talk about it being interdisciplinary. for your very insightful uh, lecture that triggered very new ideas. 
everything was quite conceivable. Uh, but what wonders me is related to the relationship between capability and creativity. It seems to me that uh, in case of native speakers, uh, they are interrelated and mutually reinforcing each other. But with regard to the uh, role of errors, how can we uh, uh, delimit students' creativity, non-native speakers of English, creativity? And what is the role of teachers with regard to this new interpretation of creativity and the, the uh, concern for uh, improving learners' accuracy and accurate performance, especially in EFL context and especially for ELT students who are supposed to become uh, models for their prospective students in the future. Thank you very much. Mm, thank you. Yes, I mean, that is... Um, you mentioned accuracy, and that uh, accuracy and conformity um, to code rules and the communicative conventions, that is the objective. Um, and that is, as you say, that is what is the primary um, um, aim of teachers, because there is the exam, and it would be irresponsible for teachers to say, okay, you know, what about the exam? Um, um, I don't know, you can be creative and draw upon your own experience of language and use your own language and so on. Yes, there is, of course, an institutional problem, and it's an institutional problem, that the way in which um, English teaching has been conceived is very, very much essentially English taught as a foreign language and not English learned as a foreign language. So how does this, this get changed? In a way, there's no answer to that. Like, as with all institutional um, um, procedures, it takes a lot of time for people to get around to thinking. The world changes, but institutions don't necessarily change with them. Right? Um, so, in a way, I, I'm not suggesting at all that, therefore, that, that um, teachers should now let learners be creative, use their own language, and so on. Um, and forget about that. Clearly, they can't do that. So that there is a sense in which, and I think in a way it's always been the case, there's a sense in which there has to be a sort of double think. That the, the teachers um, have to obviously make sure that the learners are prepared for the exam. To that extent, they've got to be TGs. Right? But I think there are also, there's also scope for the learner, for the teacher, to encourage the kind of creative use of language I've been talking about. And I think that that actually might well motivate learners to subsequently conform if and when they're required to do so. So in terms of the process, I think the kind of creative process that I'm talking about, where you allow the learners to use whatever resource they have, including their own languages, that that process might motivate, be an incentive in some sense, because the language becomes more real then for the learner, that it might actually help the teacher to gain the objective of the exam. Um, so, um, um, I think the one way of doing this, for example, is to clarify the notion of appropriateness. Because at the moment, I think that many learners, maybe this is not, I don't know what the situation here is, of course, but in many places, learners are um, directed to conform, to be correct, accurate, but not really knowing why. Why should I, you know, in their minds, maybe it's going, uh, but look, you can understand me. Why, when you don't say the why, why, when I say this, why do I get penalised for this? So, um, I think because of in a way because of teacher control, the teacher says, "I, I set the limit, I set the rules, and you just, you just follow the rules. Uh, never mind why, you just do it, right? <laughs> because, of, because I tell you so." 
But if you introduce the notion of appropriateness, of course there are occasions, and this again comes out from the work of Professor Zandlova, it is appropriate to use standard English. You're still using English as a lingua franca, but you're using it because it's appropriate to do so. And you could argue that the reason why learners have to be accurate is because it's appropriate for the exam. And we all know that, that you can achieve certain objectives. Uh, and then, actually, in order to pass an exam, um, and when you're preparing for an interview, for example, um, what is appropriate behavior for an interview? Uh, it may be totally remote from your from the real world. You know, you say I, I've always been fascinated by animal husbandry, and this is why you know, my best friend was a cow, and therefore you know, I'm very interested in following this course. So, and both the interviewer and the interviewee know perfectly well this is just for the interview, right? So, just for the exam, dear learners, it's appropriate to be accurate. So I'm going to teach you to be accurate, okay, please. So. And I think that this concept of being appropriate will help in the development of what I call capability. Okay. Well, uh, I'm between, uh, I'm stuck between the rock and hard place. On the one hand, uh, we have some questions, uh, and then on the other hand, uh, consider Professor Buddhism and your time, and also the fact that Professor Buddhism has got cold, and uh, um, I knew it uh, last night. Uh, so, um, and these questions that have, uh, I have, uh, yes. I mean, these questions, some of them, in my view, I mean, I'm not, a, I don't want to be a judge, but let me quote from Professor Buddhism himself. I mean, he says, um, the art of critical reading is to know not only uh, is not only to know what to read, but also to know what not to read. And some of these questions, in my view, are, um, I mean, are not uh, appropriate for this uh, for this uh, gathering, and uh, uh, because of the time and because of uh, the priority of uh, other questions which are relevant. So um, it all depends on uh, Professor Wilson. I mean, if he wants to continue, uh, I can ask some of these questions which come uh, uh, mostly from students. Um, and, uh, some are relevant for what you've been talking, some are irrelevant, completely irrelevant, I'm afraid. Um, so, you need to know what the, what the irrelevant questions are. Sometimes the irrelevant questions are the most interesting. You're in the topic, not the irrelevant questions. Um, can I, I don't know what the program is. Can I just, can I just one of these, uh, it's not a question, it's a, it's a request uh, from you. <laughs> can I? Yeah, of course. Well, let me read it in the Sparsi, but I will translate to Ba Arza Salam, the map of South Aziz, also the Emrus, Tavallu de Mane. No time is from South Ashwin, but I'm a happy birthday. It is somebody's birthday today. <laughs> Oh, is it your birthday? <laughs> Happy birthday! That's <laughs> how Professor Wilson makes something irrelevant relevant. <laughs> I'm not sure what the schedule is, if there is a schedule, but uh, um, I, I'd be happy to uh, continue, if we could perhaps have a short break first, or, do, or how do you want to play this part? And I do, I'm very happy to do... Uh, well, um, actually, we're waiting for uh, the Vice-Chancellor of the Research, 
of the university here. Uh, any questions coming? Yeah. Um, can I can I also make a suggestion? I made several comments about um, Professor Seidelhofer's work, and as is clear, um, my own uh, interest is is very much related. In fact, inspired by the work that she's been doing. So maybe if she could, if she is willing to make a comment or two, um, in for two, two or three minutes. Um, and uh, I don't know whether she'll raise any critical remarks about my. Uh, she, I think she may be crit If she is critical about my work, it will not be for the first time. Which 
can share and, and you could actually distribute it um, or just point to it, which reads like a manifesto for elf research. So it's not that you know you come up with these ideas in the last few years, but it was always there and it just took 30 years to uh, develop. So I remember a group, group of um, PhD students there who, who picked up these critical ideas. You know, we had a, a real education in critical thinking, although we were working on quite different topics. Um, and there were students from um, yeah, from Europe, but from, from Africa, from Asia, and we all got together and thought, okay, we, we are all English teachers, and you know, why should we be worth less? And it was a difficult thing to do because we'd all gone, gone to the UK to do a British PhD, and the, the norms that you mentioned were very clearly in place, so you did have to conform at this time. Uh, and it was difficult, but we went to conferences like TESOL, uh, IATEFO, uh, um, AAAL, BAO, and had uh, discussion groups about whose language is it anyway. So this is where we developed this idea of you know, asserting our identities and rights to use the language um, in the way that um, we now do in, in health research. Um, and um, in, in, in the context of, of this special day here, I just thought about this very much and I can see very clearly how being Henry's uh, PhD students over the years led quite logically uh, to my motivation to uh, do research that supports um, all users of English and in their rights to assert um, their, well, the, the right to, assert, uh, to, to shape the language and to use it appropriately uh, for the context um, that they were using it for, such as uh, international publishing, which of course in, in most cases has to happen in English, but um, uh, when we look at um, you know, these um, uh, dichotomies, um, capability, competence, I think we can actually support um, um, academics in asserting uh, their creativity, their capability for communication uh, in a way that uh, looks at language uh, more than just English as a native language. Um, and just very briefly, that's, that's then what I went on to do, um, both uh, in the description of English as a lingua franca communication, uh, if you think back to the early 1990s, if you can, or you know, away from the literature, this was a time when nobody listened to you unless you were talking about corpus data. You know, it was a big new thing. Um, and so when you talked about it, there was a lot of talk about, um, you know, non-native teachers, etc. But basically, we didn't exist. Um, so my first task was to build this corpus, uh, which Henry mentioned, uh, the Oxford International Corpus of English, voice which is freely accessible, and that was our first uh, important um, um, concern that it should be freely accessible all over the world, um, shows how people exert exactly these capabilities in partly very high stakes encounters. I mean, testing uh, was mentioned, but um, there are many other encounters as well. Um, and then this has led to this interest in understanding the process of communication itself. Um, the nature of communication, rather than you know just uh, seeing conformity to uh, native speaker standards um, uh, played out. Uh, because if you look closely at how uh, meaning is negotiated, uh, you can see this um, this capability played out, and uh, the pro and it sort of lays bare the process of communication. And then, of course, that also leads you to the application um, of these insights in the sense of applied linguistics as mediation between expertise um, and experience um, of people. And that's uh, also what I think one is automatically working in when doing health research. I've brought um, uh, leaflets, for those of you who are interested, um, of the journal that I found at the English, uh, the journal of English as a lingua, uh, 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 journal of English as a lingua franca, where um, exactly uh, these um, concerns have been looked at. Um, so it's, it's description, but it's also application to various um, areas um, of work that we do. So I can leave that here, and I'd be very happy uh, to also um, send papers um, if there's a particular paper that anybody might be interested in. So I just wanted really to make a, a link between uh, what you started with in your introduction and um, then the, the lecture, and, and because you mentioned it several times, I would, would say that as well. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Professor Seidel Hoffer. Uh, you and Professor Whittison have been uh, unexpectedly kind to us in accepting our invitation to attend this, uh, this university. And of course, we owe this mainly to uh, our colleague at this university, Dr. Sarah Shu. But, uh, you know, our city, Professor Whittison, uh, is known as the um, city of pioneering uh, things to do. Uh, the, uh, I mean, uh, the people here are known as uh, taking the first step in doing the things. Uh, we, we were honored to receive you in Iran, uh, and as the first city, of course, I know already know that you are going to have a visit to some other places and universities in Iran. Uh, you have been ready. Uh, since, you're, since, since, since you're kind to us in accepting our invitation and that just we are unable to return a paramount amount of hospitality to you. Uh, why Professor Zeidelhofer was coming to the end of her short speech, uh, the impression that came to my mind was that you know, all human beings need to eat and Professor Whittison and Professor Zeidelhofer are no exceptions. <laughs> Uh, so, we are not going to keep you anymore here. Uh, there is a tradition, Professor, here in Iran uh, to uh, express uh, a sense of, uh, our sense of appreciation by asking the uh, officials uh, to, to attend the uh, scene, uh, the, the, the attend scene, and just uh, there is going to be a very uh, little a souvenir for all that breeze. Uh, for this, I, I'm going to invite the chancellor, chancellor of the university, the Honorable Dr. Hassan Balizadeh, to on behalf of uh, the Department of English Language and Literature at the University, Azerbaijan Shai Madani University. Equally, uh, thinking about anything as a souvenir to show how much we love you, you know, that was equally, you know, uh, you know made us unable to think of something appropriate. But however, uh, uh, on, on behalf of the staff members of this university and on behalf of the community of applied linguistics in Iran, we have prepared a Persian rock to as a souvenir from Tabriz for Professor uh, Wittesen and Professor Sankopan.
Yes. of Isfahani souvenirs because if you weren't as well, this is Tabriz and this is the souvenir from Tabriz, if you weren't Isfahan, that would be something like Gaz of Isfahan. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. I, would, I would just like to say that I feel quite overwhelmed by your generosity and the welcome that Barbara and I have received here. Um, I mentioned earlier the reciprocal relationship between teacher and student. There is also a reciprocal relationship between me and you at all here. And what happens on events like this is a kind of a little community of closeness, I think, develops. And I think Barbara and I have felt that very much indeed. We've been very touched by all your kindness and your welcome. And thank you very much uh, and for everything. Uh, 
the last study when I got from bad news and I didn't want to read that bad news. But as I said, it was a blessing in disguise and uh, God, and thank God, He helped us and uh, we, have, we have Him here and uh, um, uh, we have, uh, we established a very good memories today, and, uh, all of us, and uh, I hope uh, you uh, enjoyed his uh, and her presence in our community. And uh, I, I'm sure, I'm quite sure that, uh, uh, given the fact that this is the first time Professor Bidison and Barbara are in Iran, and uh, as uh, Dr. Amin said, uh, his uh, journey in Iran and his uh, uh, expedition in Iran started from Tabriz. I hope that we have, uh, we have, uh, we have had a good impression on them as uh, uh, true Iranians. It is my real pleasure to be here by Andy Whittleson. Uh, Kazim and I, Professor Goldtripper and I, graduated from Lancaster University with a 10 year interval. Uh, he started his study in 1982, and I started my study in 1992. What I remember from Lancaster is generosity, honesty, sincereness of all professors working in the department of, uh, it's called modern linguistics. Um, I do have very nice memories from the Quran. I heard a lot from the scientific collaboration between the Quran and, and Henry. At the same time, I do remember the uh, admiration of ex Lancaster University, London University, and Sheffield University from these professors. What I learned from, from my professors in Lancaster University, Charles Alderson, the co-right, Norman Fairclough, um, Rose Vanage, and I do remember that for all, for all my life, is that they sit with you without uh, any, um, under any expectation, they talk to you, they provide you with practical solution, and they do help you in order to solve your personal problem, problems and your economic problem. And I do thank you for coming here in order to revive us, we are revitalized here, and our past good members. Thank you. I don't want to keep you more, but because Dr. Sarashu insists, I'm going to ask one pseudo serious question from Barbara. I just understood or came to know that Henry supervised you. I wonder if you, you keep on accepting supervision now. In the interest of reciprocity, we supervise each other. <laughs> okay, I just want to say that during the last 40 or 50 years, I have been using Professor Wittison's papers, books in my graduate program, the doctoral institute, and also MA students. And what I'm amazed is this, that there is a unity of the views in all different, you know, disciplines that he expresses himself or problems that he addresses. 
when he's talking about ESP or say literature or interpretation of the poetry or language teaching, you can find a unified, a coherent system in his views. And this is very marvelous here and I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, in, uh, as a part of our preparation for this conference, Professor Woodison, we published uh, a book authored by Professor Azab Daftari in honor of you, uh, which was uh, just launched in our conference inauguration ceremony. And I'm going to just uh, provide you with a copy of the book. We are honorable, which you just we are honored uh, to have. Uh, uh, Professor Azad Daftari among us to just, just provide us with the opportunity to have this opening uh, here for this conference. Well, in this historical moment in the records of Azerbaijan Shaikh Manali University, once again, uh, I'd like to extend uh, uh, my thanks and my colleagues' thanks to uh, Honorable Dr. Hassan Balizadeh for his kind support. Uh, for this conference, and uh, Vice Chancellor uh, Dr. Ajani, who has been a great help and great support for us in being making us just able to keep this. Uh, <laughs> what remains is um, the memory of uh, having two dear professors who have uh, spent their whole lives in starting and making go on the field of applied linguistics. Uh, dear professor, uh, we, we are quite unable to put an end <laughs> to this. Uh, it's a very emotional moment. We just, uh, I, I invite the whole audience to join me in wishing a long life, a healthful, honorable, long life to two of the, uh, yeah, distinguished professors, Professor Henry Whittison and Professor Barbara Siddle. Offer just by putting their hands together.